So Elliot is, uh, okay, Elliot has a degree in biomedical engineering, trained at the Stanford D School. He studied synthetic biology for 12 years and worked for five years as a product consultant. He founded seven startups, built five laboratories and two nonprofits and has raised over $1 million, $1 million for various organizations. <laughs> every, so, every time Trump says million, I'm like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very North American reference, guys, sorry. Uh, creator of the nonprofit DIY Bio Laboratory Indie Lab. He has spoken at South by Southwest and Synbio Beta on the topic of social impact and food. He is a recipient of awards from the World Food Program, the National Science Foundation, and numerous other organizations, and holds fellowships from Cairo Society, Future Founders, and the Seasteading Institute. He has a special interest in using simple biological designs to solve physiological needs. And um, great, that's Elliot. So <laughs> Elliot, you're up. We're gonna spotlight your video, so hang tight one second. Sure. Um, Hi, everybody. Hey, Elliot. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I have a presentation on the biotechnical basis for scent. So this is going to get really fun. Uh, we're going to go through a lot of the different um, reasons and methods behind why things smell, uh, how you detect things using your nose, and then the potential applications of really cutting edge technology that allows for the creation of um, smells, flavors, and things that we can't even imagine right now. And so with that, um, I'll kind of go a little bit more in depth on myself. So I'm a bit of a mad scientist. I love, absolutely love biology. I think that uh, DNA is this interesting little coding language that um, creates the things around us. And so I became obsessed with that at a very young age starting experimenting at 14 and tinkering with DNA. And um, ever since then, over the course of my career, I've built a number of laboratories. Um, my most recent one is actually in a shipping container. So you can see uh, the initial build out there on the left. It looks a little bit cleaner now. And we actually use that shipping container laboratory to um, engineer algae uh, to produce colors for the food, cosmetic, and textile industry as a means of replacing petroleum-based ingredients in the supply chain. And so uh, we're really focused, um, my work, what really I, I kind of do on a day-to-day, -day, is focused on removing petroleum and animal compounds with carbon negative replacements uh, using algae. And so we work with a network of farmers all over the world to produce uh, various ingredients at scale. So in doing that, kind of came up with the question of like, why does algae taste bad? And I did a deep dive into the biology and biotechnology of flavor and uh, became absolutely fascinated with it. So these are some of the products and ingredients that we end up producing. I actually, if you can still see my video, I have a jar of our blue pigment right here. There you go. It's edible, you can eat it, look at that. Um, and so I've been fascinated by the things that biology can do, ranging from colors to tastes to perfumes and um, have a deep background of experience in the food industry and how they actually interact with some of these emerging ways of producing flavor. So I led a class at IAO a while back on particularly producing a uh, banana flavor uh, in microbes and like little tiny microscopic bacteria. And it was a really fun weekend course. And over the course of time, we actually produced the chemical that uh, makes the banana smell and uh, did it in a time dependent manner. And so I'll kind of touch base on that, on how we actually went about doing that. And this is more of a overview of how, um, how people actually smell things, how biology produces scent in the first place, and then what the industry is doing uh, using emerging technology and what artists are doing to explore uh, the different ways that you can use biotechnology, especially um, as a means of producing these like organic methods of growing your smells um, from scratch. So how does biology detect smell in the first place? Um, how does it detect scent? So what's really incredible about the human nose is that it's so sensitive to specific smells. Um, you have uh, proteins on the very um, 
on the very top of your nose that detect very specific molecules that uh, come in to your no nose and then trigger uh, neurons to fire in your brain. So you have a very specific pathway for different kinds of smells. And so the nose has specific detection. And, um, and so I want to kind of raise an example of that. So how many of you can actually smell asparagus after you eat it in your urine? Um, you know, for some people, they're not actually able to smell asparagus in their pee. And there's a very specific chemical in asparagus that produces that kind of like sulfuric kind of smell uh, when you go to the bathroom. And for some, they actually lack the protein receptor in your nose to detect that smell. So lucky them, they don't have to actually smell asparagus when they pee. Um, <laughs> unlucky for the rest of us that actually do. Uh, that's just kind of like a funny method of showing that your genetics, the uh, DNA of your body relates intimately with the kind of smells that we can experience and then also the smells that biology ends up producing. So how does DNA go from uh, the code of life into producing a protein? Well, proteins themselves are responsible for almost every single action in biology and DNA really codes for those proteins. You go from DNA uh, within the cell, um, it then translates it into basically a messenger, messenger RNA that sends it outside of the cell and starts producing a specific building block of nature, which is known as a protein. And proteins do everything uh, in our bodies. So these are some various proteins. Proteins actually perform actions on the basis of their structure. So anytime you actually smell something, it's because there's a specific molecule that binds to a certain structure of protein. Think of it like a lock and a key. Without the right uh, key, you can't open a lock and therefore your nose wouldn't be triggered. So in the example of the asparagus, there's a specific receptor in people's noses that can actually smell that asparagus pea smell um, that is directly related to the molecules that are produced from asparagus as it breaks down in your body. So if you don't have that protein, if you don't have that sequence of DNA, that specific gene, then you don't have the right structure to detect that molecule. And therefore you don't even smell it. So um, this can actually be applied in a variety of different ways in the opposite fashion. So this is a short informational video. Um, I hope that this presentation can go out. This is probably like a three minute video. So I'm just gonna gloss over this, but it's the actual like physical mechanics of how that all looks. I just think I geek out so much about this. I really love this kind of stuff. So you can check it out uh, later. Just look up the central dogma of biology on YouTube. Um, so how does biology create these smells then? How does it actually go about producing the smells that we detect using our nose, using those very specific receptors in our nose? And so it does it the same exact way. You take DNA and you turn it into proteins. And those proteins in particular uh, form molecules that we're able to detect. And so these proteins, they're called enzymes. And those enzymes act on uh, building blocks, basic building blocks like sugars or um, different kinds of molecules that plants, uh, animals end up absorbing. And when they bind to those different molecules, they end up creating uh, a new kind of molecule. They um, keep on existing after the fact and they just kind of like catalyze a reaction. They make a reaction occur to produce more complex or break apart molecules. And in doing so, they're able to create so many different uh, smells and tastes that we experience. So I wanted to give three examples. Um, we're gonna go through a variety of different examples so you can see what that actually looks like. So this is a specific enzyme pathway, a series of enzymes to produce monoterpenes, which are a variety of different smells and what's kind of cool is you can see the relationship between molecules and how closely related they are just on the basis of these simple um, additions or subtractions to the base molecule structure. And I, I geek out about this so much. So uh, when you have all these inputs, like think um, grapes or apples or wheat or other things like that, they produce a number of like basic, um, basic building materials, stuff like sugars, like glucose and fructose, um, or amino acids, um, different kinds of like basic building blocks. And what ends up happening 
is that those building blocks get slightly tweaked along the way to start producing some of the scents that we know of and that we constantly smell. So in particular, with a focus on monoterpenes, you have all these basic inputs by just the you know, normal growth of the plant, vegetable, animal uh, that produces these smells. So this is a, an example, and I want you to particularly focus on the right side of the screen. I'm gonna see if I can like draw a little bit. Um, where is it? Maybe I'll use a mouse. Okay, there you go. You can see my mouse focusing on the right side of the screen right here. Um, and so uh, basically each of these little dots is a specific enzyme in the pathway. So as you change from one molecule to, an, to another, each of the bolded items is a different molecule, um, you use an enzyme, a type of protein to actually produce that specific molecule. And so you can go from a basic input like this farnesyl pyrophosphate to produce a variety of different compounds like grapefruit, black pepper, um, orange, you know, those different kind of scents. Um, and then in particular, I'm gonna zoom in right here, this monoterpenoid synthases. This is just like a very fancy way of saying it's another group of uh, proteins. It's another group of molecules um, that produce other variety of fragrances. So let's see. I can unselect this. Okay, um, so if you notice before, back here, the geraniol pyrophosphate. Um, then right here, you have some additional enzymes that modify that molecule even more. So you can see just how close, closely related, just on the basis of one step away, lime is from um, this fragrance, from pine, and from uh, rose over here. So you have a variety of different scents come from the same basic molecular inputs, which is really exciting when you think about it because it means from the DNA, from the basic building blocks of life, life that um, you really aren't altogether too far off from producing um, the various flavors, fragrances, and stuff like that that we experience, and that plants and um, us in general are very closely related. Uh, we're just missing a couple of those protein steps. So here's another enzyme pathway example, raspberry ketone. In this case, it takes five steps to actually produce a raspberry ketone smell, which I absolutely adore. Um, so you start with tyrosine, which is a basic amino acid, um, something that like everybody ends up consuming or producing in your body. Um, and then with a series of five steps, you go um, through this pathway, through this process to modify that initial building block into a raspberry ketone. And um, this is really exciting because you can basically take a base building block and turn it into those fragrances. So um, this is some other examples. Each of these arrows is a different kind of protein, a different kind of enzyme that's coded for by DNA. And so you can go from your input, this erythrose 5-phosphate, into raspberry ketone. But you can also just kind of like add another step or, or divert this kind of pathway to another direction to produce stuff like vanilla or rose or cinema aldehyde, cinema aldehyde um, to have that like cinnamon flavor. So all of these different steps uh, kind of shows you that these flavors are more closely related than we think and that um, the, the scents themselves, you can produce them with just a couple of proteins um, to be able to, to produce these different kinds of scents and flavors. And then this last enzyme example, uh, this is something we actually used in my class. It's one of my favorite enzymes um, because you can actually take this ATF1 um, and with different inputs, with different like building blocks, uh, the same enzyme actually goes from banana to pear to orange scent. And so using the same kind of protein, you can produce a variety of different smells, different fragrances um, based on whatever your input is. And so this is what we ended up doing in the class. Um, uh, really exciting to be able to pass along like a little microbe, a little bacteria that could produce these different kind of scents. So how do, how do you go about like actually producing this in the real world? Like where, if, if this is in a laboratory, like are we actually using this on a daily basis? And the answer is uh, over the past 10 years, yes. Um, you know, flavor and fragrance companies are starting to use this more and more. 
And so um, initially we started with this natural flavor production. Um, you would go out into nature, you would find uh, animal or vegetable or uh, you know, fruits, flowers, other things like that. And you basically extract from your natural material. And this is kind of like a very extractive method of doing things, it's very unsustainable. And then um, what ended up happening is that uh, chemists especially started figuring out, oh, these same molecules, we can produce them using chemical synthesis. You can just take basic chemical building blocks and put them together. And in uh, big factories uh, that tend to emit a lot of carbon dioxide, we can produce uh, stuff like vanillin or um, other kind of flavors and fragrances just by purifying it, not having to worry about any of the animals or things like that. That's where we got synthetics. And then lastly, what started to happen is that we're able to start producing things using microbes. And this is astounding because they're really small and fast growing and uh, they're pretty much carbon neutral, um, very low carbon emissions. And uh, you can produce tons and tons of these scents and make it even more complicated or produce things that you know the world or nature has never seen. And so as an example of that, uh, to take from my class, uh, taking a banana fragrance and uh, inserting that piece of instructions, that DNA, to make that enzyme to produce the smell in a bacteria, in a microbe. And so the way that you actually do that is you take that set of instructions that makes the protein, that makes that enzyme, and you take that little set of instructions and you put it into uh, the microbe itself. And it's this little thing called a plasmid. It's just a circular piece of DNA. And you put in the microbe, and by doing that, the microbe then grows and multiplies and starts producing that enzyme. And if it has the right building blocks, it has the right materials, then it's able to produce tons and tons and tons of your fragrance that you're interested in. So that's, what hap that's what's happening. If it has the right inputs, it ends up producing the right outputs and uh, starts growing and producing this just by the very nature of how it grows. It's very simple uh, methodology, very simple organism. So it produces lots of the scent that you're interested in. And then you can actually produce more of these microbes. And so you start from small scale, get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what this kind of looks like is big fermentation tanks like this. So imagine it's like growing beer. You can do the same kind of thing. You can take yeast and you can produce the smells that uh, we tend to experience through perfumes or even our food products. And then lastly, you tend to extract the scent from the organism using just conventional methods, or you can just filter out the organism um, from the liquid that is growing in. And so uh, this is an example of how many of the flavors and fragrance companies are actually using this technique, the biotechnology or synthetic biology. Um, so six of the top 10 companies, and remember this was 2015, there's probably even more of those companies now, uh, have entered into R&D agreements with uh, companies that do this kind of like microbial fermentation, uh, this production of enzymes and uh, flavors and fragrances using microbes, using tiny bacteria. And so as you can see, the top four flavor and fragrance companies, um, over 57% of the market, uh, have agreed to utilize these kind of techniques to produce the flavors and fragrances that we, we end up using and sourcing from these companies. So. I mean, that's the big business, but I mean, we're independent perfumers. Like, what do we do with this kind of thing? Like, how do we get access to these sort of tools that big industry ends up using? And um, that's, that's where a lot of this information comes in. Uh, and so, like, I'm really interested, my purpose is to uh, enable the democratization of this kind of biotechnology, whether it's through open access laboratories, of working with groups like the IAO, or teaching people how to actually engineer microbes to produce uh, things that can help the world. And so uh, something really interesting about this technique as opposed to others is because perfume is a very time dependent medium. If you had something like a living scent, what you could do is you could trigger the amount of smell at different times. And so you could have the smell trigger like maybe eight hours uh, into the day, or you could have it trigger based on um, the building block or material that's coming in. So I, I can give some examples of that. So um, somebody, uh, an artist who's, who's really, really wonderful ended up replicating the scent of her ex as a means of just kind of like mourning uh, the loss of this relationship. I thought that was a really beautiful thing. Um, there was uh, another group of, of artists as a means of exploring this kind of uh, reactionary scent 
um, they took the chemical signature of tears and they devised a microbe that um, if you're wearing this living uh, scent, that if somebody caused you to cry or ended up um, causing aggression, it would trigger a scent that would be a turnoff. And so in essence, being kind of like an anti-sexual uh, advance uh, method, that's like a living reactive perfume that would cause your aggressor to uh, be turned off and, and to kind of stay away, uh, limit the uh, microaggressions and se sexual advances. Um, another kind of company came up with a type of moss that actually uh, released scent every time that you, um, you kind of grew it. It would release uh, patchouli scent into the air um, as a means of cleansing the air and then also making uh, your environment smell good. And then I, I had a friend who actually introduced um, uh, myoglobin, which is a muscle protein found in steak into a tomato and started growing these tomatoes that produced this muscle protein. So it was a real true beef steak tomato. And when you fried it up, it actually tasted like a steak. And so that is kind of the astounding things that could potentially happen through, um, through like adding these enzymes, adding these proteins to uh, you know, our environment and our perfume practice. And uh, just to kind of like leave you with some of the things that related a little bit to Mauricio's uh, conversation. Um, in terms of scent, uh, there was a research group that actually went and found these like old samples of flour that went completely extinct. And they revived the flour by finding the DNA sample for the scent, for the scent of that flour. And they recreated an extinct flower um, and were able to produce that, that scent. And now um, people are able to actually like experience and utilize that scent. So that smell is still preserved, even if that flower is extinct. And so something like that is really astounding to the, the kind of um, things that you can do with synthetic biology and biotechnology. So thank you so much. Um, this is my contact information. So if you have additional questions or want to collaborate or anything like that, please reach out to me at Elliot at Spirit Inc. Um, or all of my social media is at that Mr. E. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. And uh, yeah, Elliot gave a workshop here at the Institute gosh, last year, I guess. And, and indeed, like we, we were working with banana scent, but based on I don't, I don't remember what we did, to be honest, but based on whatever it was that we did, it came at different times. Uh, so the time of, of that molecule was, was different from traditional sort of, you know, benzyl acetate, was it? Um, mm -hmm. So for me, as someone who works with a lot of independent perfumers, I was like, oh my God, the potential. Can you guys imagine a lemon smell that comes two hours into the perfume? You know? Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of questions, of course. Uh, so first, Kurt uh, is asking, any thoughts on Luca Tiran's vibration theory of olfaction versus the lock and key? Hmm. Um, yeah. That's a really interesting question and relates to like uh, pretty much quantum biology, which is a rare, like a as to uh, unexplored, um, not as explored, um, Kind of research topic. And so I don't know too much about the vibration theory of uh, scent detection. I do know that um, vibration is how we actually stimulate the neurons for hearing. And so it, it's kind of like could potentially be possible that um, the impact of molecules stimulate and trigger um, neuronal activity and cause you to actually like, you know, smell things. Um, yeah, I think that the lock and key receptors, they've uh, shown to be working in the olfactory bulb. And so that's actually um, kind of scientifically proven. There have been receptors that are directly tied to specific smells that humans experience. Um, so yeah, I, I would love to learn more. If you have a specific link or something, post it in the chat for everybody else. Um, yeah, and, and Luca will probably be giving another version of his quantum smelling talk uh, at the Institute uh, online, at the Institute, meaning in the cloud soon, um, because we've, we've been in touch about that. So if you guys are curious about that, keep an eye on our schedule. Mm -hmm. um, okay, KT Lewis says, Elliot, I'm curious what you think about the space or distance between our biological ability to detect protein structures like you described and the language we have to identify what we smell. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my work as a beverage professional, I've observed that people are limited in their ability to describe the character of a wine, for instance, by things they already have words for, but if someone else names a note, they will suddenly be able to notice it. 
Yeah, yeah. So that is a very good point about the limitations of our own sensing organ versus what is available uh, in terms of like analytical chemistry and the kind of measurement tools that we have access to right now. And so even now, um, because uh, scent molecules are in such small amounts and the human nose is so sensitive, it's still kind of on the uh, perfumist or whoever is actually smelling the scent themselves to identify that scent. And so there is a key component there where if you lack the vocabulary to identify the scent, psychologically, it's very difficult for you to point out those molecules and identify the specific molecules in the mix. And so like in uh, organizations like IAO are equipped to kind of expand the, the scent vocabulary, but I'm, I'm really intrigued by emerging technologies like an e-nose or a GCO, gas chromatograph, um, for like olfactory uh, detection, stuff like that, where you're able to get more and more specific. It's just in that scent molecules are in such low quantities that it's very, very difficult. Um, some emerging technology that may account for this is that um, there have been uh, kind of like organs on a chip, and so like a nose gr grown on a Petri dish that can simulate the same kind of behavior of a human nose and relate it more so to something, something a lot more um, digital uh, information as opposed to the kind of analog information that we now uh, get from our nose and a, a little more specific, a little more accurate. And it means that that's part of the reason why these flavor and fragrance companies are shifting away from their conventional like chemical synthesis or extraction methods. It's because this um, methodology of using DNA to produce uh, you know, specific scents, it, it's something that's a lot more protectable from an intellectual property standpoint. And so when you have a device that can actually take a look at a perfume and detect every single compound in that perfume and recreate it, it becomes more important for them to come up with a brand new process of creating scents or create scents that have never been experienced before. And so um, that's kind of the intriguing aspect of some of this emerging technology and some of the analytical devices that are kind of coming about and what has happened from an industry reactionary standpoint because of that. Thanks, Elliot. Um, Devin, uh, who's speaking next week on perfume for avatars, is asking actually Elliot if you have a particular e nose that you find most reliable uh, for measuring for scent creation, or is the human nose still the best way to do that? Um, I would say just from a price standpoint, the human nose is still <laughs> your best bet. Um, from from my stance, e noses are a little little uh, inaccessible right now. Um, in fact, I think there's only five GCOs in the entire United States. Um, able to detect uh, kind of odor compounds. And so it's, it's difficult to get access to these kind of analytical tools. And so therefore, the human nose is still one of the most reliable. Um, I'm really interested in kind of the application of biotechnology to uh, create, you know, those variety of receptors so that we're able to have more accessible uh, e-noses and, and things of that nature. There was a particular company, um, Aromatics, I think is what they're called, um, spelled a little funky. Uh, and they had one that's a little more accessible, a little more price access accessible, but um, still kind of out of the reach of this uh, biohacking um, kind of methodology that I practice. And then uh, Mauricio is asking if you see a potential end goal of replacing petrochemically derived synthetics with this sort of technology, and I imagine. Yeah, I, I would hope so. And um, I think that is what the goal of the industry has been um, in terms of anybody working in biotechnology is to find uh, cleaner, greener ways of producing the things that we use. Okay, okay. Clara, do you have anything you want to add or share? Or... No. Oh, clear. Thanks, Elliot. Yeah, I know that was a lot lot of information in a very short amount of time. Um, yeah. But <laughs> um, yeah, so if anybody has additional questions or things like that, I think that um, especially just from a base understanding of, of the way scent was is created in uh, the organisms and naturals that we end up using, uh, really important to take a look at it from a holistic like biological perspective about how DNA is the thing that creates um, these enzymes that make these smells. And so um, 
it's kind of cool when you remove the organism from the process or you move this kind of like petrochemical process and you're able to do something that's a lot more accessible. Something that I'm hoping eventually we can kind of brew up a batch of a small batch of like uh, beer or something, craft beer in our houses. And we're able to produce the kind of fragrances that um, we end up using and mixing with. Um, anybody can really get started. I think my first lab I built for, you know, a couple hundred bucks and it enabled me to start tinkering around with microbes. Uh, you can now get kits from places online like the Odin. And um, I'm going to post a guide in the uh, chat that was something I wrote up on how people can get started.